Praise the Lord, everybody. We're here to worship the Lord today. Thank you for joining us, and uh, God is a good God. Thank you for joining Resurrection Life Highway Tabernacle as we worship the Lord today and as we sing God's praises. And um, I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to be reading from Psalm 71, verses 1 through 11. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O oh Lord God, you are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from my birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually to you. I have become as a wonder to many, but you are my refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. Thank you, Father God, for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for allowing us to worship you together. We thank you for your grace today. Fill us with your presence. And may we, may we be full of joy as we come into your courts and give you praise and give you glory. We thank you that you are a God that never forsakes your people. We thank you for your love that we can always turn to you and turn our hearts after you and hunger and thirst for the living God. We love you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and may we continue to just worship the Lord with everything in us. May we give all the praise to the God that protects us and counsels us and gives us strength and keeps us from the hand of the enemy and enables us to rejoice as his people before him. Amen.
Even though these are difficult times, we can thank God for the fact that we have the ability still to hear the Word of God on a Sunday morning, you know, still to share these services over YouTube. And this week as I was praying, one of the things that I thought of was that this might not be something that's available to every church. Um, even though it's difficult for us, there are churches who have it a lot more, um, for, for whom things are a lot more difficult than they are for Highway Tabernacle and Resurrection Life. Imagine. Uh, congregations who can't hear from their pastor, who can't hear from the Word of God, and can't even get together in the way that we do it. So I think that one of the things that we need to do uh, as a church of God is to remember them in prayer. And when we pray, also ask God whether there's anything that we can do uh, in order to help that. You know, we might have neighbors who are out of fellowship. We might have neighbors who uh, are, are co-workers or relatives uh, who haven't been able to get into services and uh, really think a little bit beyond ourselves. So the verse that I wanted to share with you this morning, the passage that I wanted to share for you this morning from Hebrews chapter 13, I would never want to uh, dilute the message here, which is so important that we need to remember those who are in prison and those who are suffering as though we were suffering with them. That's one of the large responsibilities that we have as a church. We need to make sure that uh, we have sympathy, we have empathy for those who are going through difficult times, um, imprisonment and, and other kinds of suffering. But I think that we also need to have that sort of empathy for other needs in the church as well. Let's not just say that, you know, we're okay, we're still able to meet, we're still able to have service and not remember those downstream, those of us who are having a harder time. So Hebrews 13, the first three verses, let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though you were in prison with them, and the mistreated as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. Um, so just again, that call to love, that call to hospitality, and that call to empathy. As a reminder every week, just wanted to let you know that we are still here. We would love to hear from you. Um, you might not think that it's anything big, it's not any major piece of news, but just checking in and letting us know, hey, we're still out there, um, we're still praying for the church, we're still thinking about you. So feel free to contact us by email, welcome at highway or welcome at RLC. Uh, Pastor Mark has uh, put his uh, phone number on our website and it's available here on the screen. Uh, you can reach uh, Pastor Finney at Resurrection Life uh, either through Facebook or at WhatsApp at Finney Cora Villa. And then, again, we do have that Highway um, Facebook group. You know, just share remembrances, just share little messages of encouragement. If you have any pictures, any news that you'd like to share, um, we just want to make sure that even though we can't be together in purpose, uh, in purpose, in person, at least for a season, that we can still share that fellowship, share that hospitality one with another. So I would encourage you to take uh, advantage of that and please let us hear from you. And once again, thank you so much for praying for the needs of the church. God is our supply and God is faithful, but God works through us. And um, so as you pray, as you ask God uh, for the needs of the church, um, pray also listening and saying, you know, Lord, what would you have me to do at this time? I recognize that these are difficult times for a lot of people, uncertain times for a lot of people. Your income may have changed and may have decreased. And again, if that's your situation and the church can help, please let us know and uh, we will see you know, what we can do about that. Um, but... Uh, as we are able, as you know, God enables us, we are still responsible for being 
good stewards of the tithe, of, of the, uh, the, the funds that God has provided us with in tithes and an offering. So you can give online, you can give through the Easy Tithe app, you can give by text, um, you can send it by mail, your tithe by mail, and if necessary, you can even drop it off through the mail slot at the Church Parsonage, 552 North 18th Street. And it's always encouraging to me, um, even though we can't be together, to see that people are still being faithful in tithes and offerings. And I thank you so much for that. Lord, we do thank you for the heart of generosity that is a hallmark of your church, a hallmark of your people. And Father, I do pray for those who are in need, uh, financial need, um, going through periods of uncertainty at this time, we pray in agreement and in solidarity with them. And ask, Father, that you would continue to make a way for us, for all of us. And um, thank you for supporting the needs of this church. Thank you for keeping us here. Lord, we, our goal is to bring glory to your name, and we thank you that you enable that. Watch over us, we pray. Amen. Well, hello. Highway Tabernacle and Resurrection Life people. You are sorely missed. And starting next week, we're going to uh, have a, an update as we move closer to the time of our gathering together. Uh, we're going to share with you where we are in the process. Right now, we're patiently waiting, like so many uh, brothers and sisters across, across the country and even across the world. We're waiting because we want to serve our community. We want to make sure that we're doing our part to not spread this virus, but the most important thing that we can do is we can honor God, we can pray, we can love, we can continue to do what we're doing by walking in the Spirit. And before we bring the message to you today, I'd like to open up in prayer, and we're going to specifically pray for people whose uh, lives have been deeply affected by the sickness and by this uh, time that we're in. So would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your awesome presence and we are aware from the word of God that nothing takes you by surprise. That you did not promise us to uh, be free from all uh, problems in life. In fact, you said that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. And so, Lord, we're praying for uh, the afflictions that different people <clears throat> have gone through, specifically related to the virus, those who have lost loved ones. Even this week that I know of, in my heart, I'm thinking of that one person, I pray in Jesus' name that the comfort of the Holy Spirit will come upon them. They would be filled with hope, not despair. Lord, those who are sick and recovering, we pray that uh, their body would be able to be strong and, and be able to have uh, a deep, subtle peace in their spirit that, that all is well with their soul. And Lord, we pray for the, the Church of Jesus Christ as we are somewhat socially distant from one another. We pray, Lord, that we will continue in prayer and in the Word of God and in fellowship with one another as we can. So Lord, as we now turn our attention to the scriptures, we pray for hearts that would be receptive. Um, give us not only a mind that would try to understand, but a, a deep sense in our spirit, Lord, that we need you, that we, we must have your word. So in the name of Jesus, we ask for the Holy Spirit's anointing. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> And so we are in a series called Stir It Up from the book of 2 Peter. And if you're honest with yourself, we need to have our souls stirred. We have a tendency as we go through life to kind of become too settled. We get our routine going, we get you know, the normalcy of our lives, and we can have that settling turn into laziness of spirit. And so the Holy Spirit wants to stir us up, to keep us uh, alert, to keep us on fire, to keep us uh, a great blessing to others. So this is a series that we are now finding ourselves in uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 22. And I want to speak to you today on the subject that we talked about last week in part, and that is red flags. The title of the message today is, That's a Red Flag. 
We'll call it part two. Well, this past week, Thursday, uh, Terry and I celebrated our 43rd anniversary. And I thought about this and this whole life of getting to know uh, people and getting to know Terry specifically. And as the years go by in a relationship, you find out more and more what that person likes and what that person doesn't like, what that person loves and also what that person hates. And in a similar way, our relationship with God is an experience of getting to know what God loves, but also what God hates. So, chapter number one in 2 Peter, the Lord showed us in his word what he loves, what he loves to see growing in us. He gives us the grace to be able to grow, and he gives us these wonderful qualities that we can pursue. And what are they again? Well, faith and goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, Brotherly affection, love, these are amazing qualities that God wants to uh, overflow in our lives to be a great blessing to others. And as much as God loves these, there are also things that God hates. And in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, we see people who are called false teachers. They have infiltrated the church, they are among the people, and they're pretending that they're following God, and they talk about Jesus, and talk about the Bible, but their conduct, they have things they're doing in their lives that God says he hates. So as we read this chapter, uh, for, in verses 10 through 22, I want you to look with me to discover what these things are. Not so that we can just look down on these false teachers and say, oh, they're such wicked and bad people. They were, but we have to say, Lord, what is it that you want me to learn from this? How can I benefit from this? Chapter number two, beginning with verse 10. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrain the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves 
to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and again are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Amen. The reading of God's Word. Amen. So what I want to talk to you about today is this, is stay away from what God hates. In other words, see the red flag. When I was in college, someone made a statement that has stayed with me the rest of my life. I think of it frequently. The statement is this, a fool must learn from his own mistakes, but a wise person can learn from the mistakes of others. And so as we read this chapter, I pray to myself and for others, I say, God, what are those red flags that we can learn from? So we don't have to uh, experience the same experiences that they will have as a result of their relationship with God. What are some of the sins that God hates? God hates pride. Now, as we go through these, we're going to ask questions as well. For example, why does God hate pride? Well, God is a God of truth. And God knows who He is. And pride is a form of worship of self where instead of getting to know God and walking in relationship with God, pride exalts ourself into a life of deception. So God hates pride because God is a God of truth and pride deceives us. We walk in a lie. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I have, have had more time on my hands so I've been doing more reading. And I came across an author Fyodor Dostoevsky, a Russian author back in the 1800s. And I've been uh, listening, actually an audio book, I've been listening to his, uh, one of his books. And a quote just came out to me uh, from that book. It was uh, so powerful. This is what it says. Fyodor said, Above all, do not lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him and so loses all respect for himself and for others. And having no respect, he ceases to love. I read that and I said, wow, that is so true. We live in a world that's full of lies, but the greatest lies of all are the lies that we tell ourselves. And there are some people in life who will go through their whole life saying to themselves, I don't need God, I don't want God, I don't have any desire in my heart. Lies, lies, lies. Pride separates us from God. That's why God hates it so much. James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to to the humble, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. So God hates pride because it separates us from Him. Now, when we go back to the book of 2 Peter, we ask this question, how were these people proud? How were these false prophets or false teachers arrogant? They pretended to have great power and to have great knowledge. Take a look in verse number 10. 
The Bible says, bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Now, this is a little bit of an enigma. We, we kind of say, what in the world is this talking about? Heaping abuse on celestial beings. And we kind of, as a detective, could put the pieces together and we would get from this that these false teachers had such pride that they thought they could uh, boss demons around and have long conversations with the devil and mock the, th the demons and call them names. So they put themselves on a high plane. Jesus told us that we had powers over the enemy, but we're never going to have long discussions with the enemy. But these people prided themselves on you know, this kind of fake power. They pretended that they knew so much about the unseen world. The Bible says, but these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. So they had no clue what they were doing, but they did it anyway. And so we need to hate what God hates, and God hates pride. So the opposite then of pride is humility. Stay humble. Walk with God in humility. In his first book, Peter wrote this in chapter 5, verse 6. He said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And he went on to say, casting all your cares upon him, because he cares for you. You want to know how God cares for you? Well, humble yourself before God and ask for his help and worship him and seek him. Stay away from what God hates. God hates immorality. We see here from chapter 2 that the immorality that is specified is the sexual immorality. And so the question comes up, well, why does God hate sexual immorality? Did God, picture this way, did God uh, create mankind and put him in a, like, a large gymnasium? Just think of this picture. You know, you're in this big gymnasium, and there are lines in, uh, in the gymnasium, and God's saying, I want you to be able to play on this side of the lines, but I don't want you to cross this line and go over there in that area and play. And then, did God just arbitrarily you know, make lines? Or did God say, well, because I'm going to show them who's boss, I'm going to put these lines down. Why did God give us uh, commands? And why did God warn us and challenge us about sexual immorality? Because God loves us. And he knows that the life that pleases him, the best life we can have, is a life that is faithful to him is a life that avoids sexual immorality. He loves people. He loves all people. And when a person gives themselves over to sexual immorality, then they have an outlook toward others that's disrespectful. That instead of loving God's people, there's a, a disrespect in a sense of using God's people. Immorality, for example, causes a man to look at women just as objects, and not as people. And remember that a man who is on the prowl for sexual gratification doesn't really love a woman, even though he might say he loves a woman. He basically is following his uh, fallen instincts and he's loving himself and using other people as a way to love himself. So we have to be aware, be very careful, because God hates sexual immorality. Now, God doesn't hate sex because he made us this way. Genesis says that God made them male and female. And God you know, has a, a place of pleasure and fulfillment for the sexual drive. But we know... We live in a culture and in a country 
that is so out of control. That everywhere we go, we're just bombarded with images and even people in the immodest dress and so on. We're just we're inundated with a flood of this kind of thinking. So we have to be aware that God loves us, but he hates sexual immorality. So we have to be careful. How are these people immoral? The Bible tells us that they pretended to love the people of God, but they were really on the lookout for their own sexual fulfillment. The Bible says in verse 14, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. So if God hates this, then what is the opposite of immorality? It is living a life that will be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, here's what Peter said. But just as he, the Lord, who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. As it is written, be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. Something else that God hates, mentioned here in 2 Peter, is greed. Stay away from what God hates. Now, why does God hate greed? Now, God doesn't hate money. I mean, money is just an object that we need to go through life. And Paul told Timothy that the love of money was the root of all evil, not money itself. But God does hate this thing we call greed, because greed is a form of idolatry. Money and the pursuit of it can actually replace God. And people who are, their aim in life is to get rich, what they're doing is they're, they're pushing God out of their life and they're saying, I can solve all my problems with money and I can trust money to be my savior. Now they might not say it in those words, but that's what they're doing if they have a spirit of greed. Greed also looks at people with no compassion because a greedy person just looks at someone of how they can use them to get the money that they want. Every week it happens to me, I don't know about you, but every week I have either a scam call or something in the mail, or something in the email, trying to trick me and deceive me so that I can send out money to be lost, to be used by someone who is blatantly lying because they're filled with greed. So how uh, were these people that Peter talks about, how were they greedy? The Bible says in verse 14, they are experts in greed and a cursed brood. And Peter also brings out the example of a man named Balaam. I'm going to talk about him very briefly here, but you can read the story in Numbers chapters 22 through 25. And if you remember at that time, Moses was leading the people of Israel. They had come out of Egypt, they were out for about 39 years or so, and they were about ready to cross over into the Promised Land. And they found themselves, as this whole nation of people, maybe about two million people, they found themselves uh, in the land of Moab, which was just across the river, the Jordan River, from Israel. And the king of Moab, his name was ba Balak, and uh, Balak was very nervous about the Israelites, and he thought that they might attack them, and he just, he wanted to get rid of them. So, he called upon a prophet named Balaam. Balaam, I guess, had a reputation in the area. So King Balak sent uh, men to this prophet for hire. They offered Balaam a lot of money to come and to curse the Israelites. And the story goes on to tell us that Balaam did not curse the Israelites. And he, in fact, he blessed them. God spoke through him and he blessed them. But Balaam still loved the money. 
that King Balak wanted to give to him. So Balaam worked out another plan and helped the king to weaken the nation of Israel. And what they did was the country of Moab invited the Israelite men into their cities and their camp to participate in the feasts and the celebrations of their gods. And included in those celebrations was a sexual immorality. So the Israelite men were having sex with the Moabite women. And this brought about uh, you know, displeasure and judgment from God upon the nation of Israel. Balaam was responsible for that. This prophet for hire. And later, uh, we see in the book of Joshua that when the promised land was being uh, taken over by Israel, the Israelites, Balaam was one of those who was killed in this time as well. So we're given this example to not be like Balaam. Now, what's the opposite of greed? Generosity. By the way, just because a person has money, a lot of money, doesn't mean they're greedy. I have met people who have very little money at all, but are extremely greedy. So it's not the amount of money that you have, it's your heart toward the money. So be generous with what God has given to you. Think of greed as the virus. Instead of COVID, think of it as covet, which it is. Greed is covetousness. So if greed is the virus, then generosity is the vaccine. We know that we're free from greed when we're able to give, when we're able to live a life of hands open toward God and toward others. Yeah. So enjoy life and be a generous person. The last thing that I want to tell you here uh, about what God hates has to do with backsliding. God hates backsliding. Now, don't misunderstand me. God doesn't hate backsliders. He doesn't hate the people. In fact, we see in the Old Testament, there's a verse that says, I am married to the backslider. That God loves people, and even though they've wandered, we see that in the prodigal son. The father still seeks with a heart broken for the son that's gone away from home. So God loves the backslider, but he hates backsliding. Backsliding is very simply letting our relationship with God cool and just going away from him. Why does God hate this? Well, backsliding hurts us. It brings us shame. The scriptures uh, in 2 Peter bring out the illustrations of a dog and a pig, very uh, despised animals in the Jewish culture at that time. And uh, I grew up around dogs, and so I've seen this myself, where a dog, you pardon the expression, but the Bible uses it, a dog vomits, then it kind of walks away a little bit, and then comes back to its own vomit and starts eating it. It's very disgusting. This is a, quite an image of a person who once reveled in God and close to God, but now doesn't want to hear it anymore. And the pig that was washed, the pig that was cleaned up, it goes right back to that ugly cesspool, the mud and all that other stuff. So God hates backsliding because it hurts us, it brings shame to us, and it also brings disrespect toward God. When we backslide away from God, and people have known us as those who have served God and loved God, we're saying, well, God isn't really real. You know, this serving God stuff doesn't work. We're bringing uh, disrepute to the name of the Lord Jesus. So how did these people backslide? How did these people that were uh, false teachers, I mean, they didn't get that way overnight. Maybe they started out really well. Maybe they started out with a heart for God. Here's what the Bible says. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs 
on the sacred command that was passed on to them. So here's the key for us to understand backsliding. Backsliding happens when we turn, the Bible says, turn our backs on the sacred command. Now what this means is that when once we love the Word of God, we turn our backs on the Word of God and no longer listen, no longer love God's Word, no, no longer want to hear any preaching. We're just filled with our own thoughts and we're filled with the thoughts of the world. That's backsliding. What's the opposite of this? Stay faithful. Now, I don't have any deep truth here to tell you about staying faithful, like there's some kind of, uh, you know, treasure that's uh, on the other side of the world that you have to go and discover. But here it is. Stay faithful by getting into the Word of God every day and by praying to the Lord every day. I don't know how else to say it. But God is faithful to us, but He expects us to seek Him. I'm not sure who told me this. I'm not sure if it was my wife or somebody in the last week or so. I thought, this was real good. Charles Spurgeon was asked one time, what was more important, prayer or Bible study? And he asked him the question, Spurgeon did, well, what is more important to you, breathing in or breathing out. Last week, I read an account of a woman who lived outside of uh, Indianapolis in Indiana. And she was traveling along in a vehicle with three of her children, two daughters, four and seven, and a son, 13. And it had been raining uh, very hard. And they came to a bridge that they crossed over many times before. But as they crossed the bridge, they didn't realize that part of this bridge had been washed away by the strong currents of that overflowing stream. And this mom and these three children all perished. The car was swept away, and it took quite a while to find them. A very sad story. What if someone who had lived close by there saw and recognized that the part of the bridge had gone out, and even in spite of the rain and the bad weather, they had come out to that bridge and they had a red flag, and they were waving it down, to the, waving the, the the car that was coming, they're waving them down, saying, stop, turn around. Now, maybe at first the children might have thought, yeah, you know, this guy is, looks like he's, you know, he's crazy. Or, this is kind of irritating. We can't even get across the bridge to go where we want to. They would thank that person. They would be so grateful because he would spare their lives. And I say this in conclusion that the red flags of the Bible are not to just somehow think, well, this is crazy, or for us to become irritated because we can't do everything we want. The red flags of the Bible are given to us so that we can have life. Jesus came, the Bible says, that we might trust in him so that we would not perish, but have everlasting life. So I ask you, do you love Jesus? Do you really? Are you willing to follow him? Are you willing to love what he loves and to hate what he hates? Then not only embrace the promises of God, but also grab hold of the warnings of God and heed the red flags for your benefit, for my benefit. May the Lord bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. I'd like to pray with you. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. And thank you that you allow us the gift of repentance. That even, 
even if we're going toward a bridge that is broken, that is flooded, and that is danger, you give us warnings, and you allow us, Lord, to turn. You give us the gift of repentance. And so, Heavenly Father, anyone that has been listening to this message, any one of us that has been participating in any of these um, things that you hate, whether it's pride or immorality or greed or backsliding, whatever it is, Lord, please give us, uh, give us the courage to turn away from them, Lord, to be honest with you, but to come before you in humility and asking you as a father that you will help your children. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your keeping power. Thank you for your salvation. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who is hearing this message who does not know you, who has not surrendered to you. In Jesus' name, may this day be the first day for them, Lord. The first day. The day of salvation, which you said that you have offered to us today. And thank you, Lord, that whosoever will may come. So if you're listening to this message and you don't have a relationship with Christ, that you don't know him, as the Bible tells us that we can know him, then you can pray. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care where you've been. He's willing to meet you now and to put you on a roadway to where you should go. Thank you, Jesus. You just have to talk to him and be honest with him and ask him. May the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you, Jesus. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you, Jesus.
Thank you.